we're going to talk about what may be the most difficult management problem humanity has ever faced, and that is managing the transition from narrow intelligence to general intelligence. Um, we started off uh, last July uh, with Security Council taking a look at these questions. Uh, it mostly focused on narrow intelligence. Uh, China did talk about super intelligence. Uh, nobody else did. And Russia said they don't want to have any trans or transnational or supranational organization because the United States or the West would would um, would dominate. So therefore, the question of governance of this topic really would have to move this to the General Assembly uh, rather than Security Council. And the uh, the, the president of uh, uh, the General Assembly, uh, I mean, I mean the, the Secretary General of the UN did say he was going to put together a task force to come up with uh, some ideas on this. And they did their initial report in December, and it was pretty bland. Uh, it said, well, we didn't come up with a model. Uh, we'll talk about that later on. And said some very nice things that were less detailed than it had already been written by other uh, others, uh, unfortunately. So it was a bit disappointing. Hopefully that'll do a little better on the next final report. Then the next move uh, was with uh, parliaments. Uh, 70 parla uh, parliamentary uh, governments were represented in Montevideo, uh, Uruguay, to a meeting that uh, took a look at the taking, to, to take parliaments to have a committee for the future to take a look at the whole game. And what should that, if they do that, then what should be at the top of their agenda? And the agreement was it should be artificial general intelligence. They're supposed to, I don't know if they have, that they're supposed to have created some drafts and share them with each other. So because it, it, this is going to be a whole, <laughs> a whole of humanity effort here. And, and, uh, but the trouble is they may be, I, I fear that they're so nervous about saying something stupid that they won't do that first draft. I think they've got to do those first drafts. They've got to share them. They can be classified. They can be secret. But we as a people and the parliamentary systems have to get this together because it's where the rubber hits the road to a large degree is parliamentary rules on this stuff. That's what gives the authority for, for standards and enforcement and all the rest of it. Then the next move was uh, over to UK uh, with the, uh, the, the Blatchford uh, meeting on, on AI safety. Uh, a very nice agreement. Uh, 28 countries signed it, say, let's all collaborate. But they were talking again about narrow intelligence and generative intelligence. They did use the word frontier, but as you listen to people when they are talking, what they're really talking about is narrow intelligence, not, again, not the future general intelligence so much. Then there is a meeting between uh, the United States and China in San Francisco that says, all right, we're going to collaborate. We're going to figure out how to get this done, done as the two sort of main leaders. That was nice. Uh, and then it turned out that there was a, a, a Financial Times did a, um, a, a, an article, to my knowledge, they're the only source of this information, that there was a secret meeting between China and the United States held in Geneva before the UN Security Council meeting and before the Blatchford meeting in the UK. So apparently there's some nice stuff maybe going on that I am not privy to. Uh, then the UN had a, a resolution initiated by the United States and Another 122 countries uh, signed on and approved by consensus by everybody. And uh, it's a very nice document. It's a lot of good words, uh, a lot of good ideas. I applaud it. But again, it's for narrow intelligence. It's not really addressing the, the advanced uh, future general intelligence stuff. Um, anyway, but, but then in April, uh, Biden and the president still continued to talk. So at least there seems to be some quiet negotiations going on there. Maybe some of you may know what the content is. Now, I grant you that the distinctions between narrow, general, and super are not as clear and crisp as this graph would give you. But they are. So it may be a gradation going between each of these. However, to me, the only place that humanity's got a chance in this game is that transition between narrow and general, however gradations you talk about. Uh, and, it, and I think we need a, a convention that then authorizes a, a eventually an agency that implements this stuff. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But to me, that's the, the bold point. Because once we get to general, uh, general learns and moves faster than we're going to be able to manage too easily. And I think that's where we lose control going into super. And so to me, the only place we can really do is right now for the next few years get these agreements together.
Uh, we've got a study going on right now, three phases. We've we put together a list of 22 questions, which just by themselves, the 22 questions are worth your time to think through yourself. Uh, then with this was uh, given out to 55 uh, AGI leaders to address uh, whichever one they wanted to. And we got a 60 page report, which is available online. Then the next step, we said, okay, what are some of the regulations and what are the governance models? So then that report is 99% is done. And then hopefully we'll start soon to write some scenarios uh, on how it works and how it doesn't work. Um, the Of the five models that we threw out there in the questionnaire, uh, the, the one that got the highest number, 51% of people said either it's very highly important or high. I mean, this is, it was a multi-stakeholder trans institute in partnership with a system of AGI narrow intelligences. So it's just, it's human and AI. It's a hybrid, <laughs> a hybrid management system, so to speak, but also multi-stakeholders, not just nation states. So it's not, it's not the International Atomic Energy Agency model. It's, it's a unique sort of a, a model where we have the, the key players in the game interacting and also augmented by artificial intelligence. Um, the next uh, model that was discussed uh, and rated uh, second highest was a multi-agency model with a UN AGI agency as the main organization, but with some governance functions managed by different parts of the UN. So it's still a, to a large degree, a UN system, not necessarily the multifaceted and a hybrid model as the first one. The third one was a decentralized governance of AGI that no one quite owns uh, in the same way that singular that, that the internet is not quite owned. Uh, there's a, a one, there's several groups, but one prominent one is a singularity net where people interact sharing codes in a platform. And then the idea is that all of these narrow interactions, maybe uh, uh, AGI emerges from that, that nobody quite owns. Um, an interesting approach there is worried that if you have centralized intelligence on this, um, there's too much power and, and it's a way to get around that. A, a third one or a fourth one is uh, put out by Eliezer Podowski said, let's stick, have several centers around the world, put all the stuff and supervise the, the chips and so forth and the electricity system, the water cooling, you know, put it several locations and then have treaties, which countries can use it uh, based upon how, how their input. And then the last one was create two divisions within a UN system, one for narrow AI and one for general. The reason for that is because every time we start to move forward on these things, people fall back into narrow. And so, so distinguish that. Now, uh, my time is just about up, so I'm going to race through these things. Uh, we, I, we have suggestions for the developers. We, we thought that there ought to be rules for developers. There got to be rules for governments themselves, how they give the licenses out and, and how those licenses are certified by UN systems. And I make, I'll make this PowerPoint available to everybody later on. So what are the things, some of the things the UN should do? And what are the things that the users themselves should do? And so what we need next is a UN convention. Any country, any country can initiate a U UN General Assembly resolution to say, uh, resolve that a committee of the willing gets together and starts to write up a UN convention on artificial intelligence with two sections, one for narrow, one for general. Um, and um, that's the end of my time, I think. Okay, uh, Mariana, are you all set to go next? One, one? Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, there we go, good, uh, all right, sorry. there you are. Uh, yeah, I dare to say that our project is uh, one of the most complex and uh, really good approach of a framework how to deal with uh, AGI. And my contribution today uh, will be uh, in this perspective. But before moving on the reasoning about a AGI, I would like to talk about briefly about AI. Uh, this is not because um, uh, I neglect the importance of uh, AGI, uh, but uh, this is because at some point we may encounter overlapping of uh, unresolved or unresolvable problems related both to AI and AGI. And it is, this is not that much discussed. Um, 
we know uh, that this phenomenon is unprecedented and never before in human history has there been such an accelerator of time and uh, a multiplier both of risks and opportunities. Um, and I recently spoke at a conference where my presentation was on how AI is transforming the law, the lawsuits, and the judiciary system. Uh, and people there, uh, this was a European network of uh, um, prosecutors and uh, judges, were not prepared at all. And I can prove that we already started on a wrong approach. If we make a comparative analysis between uh, European Union AI, AI Act and Biden Act and Bletchley Declaration and also the declaration you already mentioned, uh, we'll see some differences, especially, for example, uh, in United States, face recognition is um, not forbidden, it's uh, permitted. And here in European Union, with some exclusion, it's already forbidden. So we already started to create different jurisdictions. And this is one significant risk that we should consider um, not only for AI, but for AGI. And even on the even if we do that on the basic level, starting from AI, uh, we'll uh, multiply these effects with um, uh, AGI. So, um, and when we don't have time to build a valuable reflection uh, of the events that are surrounding AI, uh, because they are so new and unprecedented and superimposed every day, uh, we could not create values and then we could not transform these values into norms. And when AGI evolve or self evolve, the value alignment would be really challenging. Um, so uh, I suggested to uh, this European network of judges and prosecutors uh, to start to think about a legal system that is fluid and reactive. And I call that uh, fluid law uh, because um, uh, the law is already transformed and um, in, in lawsuit, in litigation, especially in China and in Estonia, um, judges uh, feel them uh, challenged to, to oppose decisions that are proposed and made by AI because there is misunderstanding between the, the concepts. And this is a very good example of lack of value alignment and the lack of understanding of the reasoning of the super rational reasoning of AI and our reasoning as human beings and professionals. So this is uh, another, this is more uh, content analysis, not uh, like proposing uh, a way how to organize the process and to govern and con control AGI. But if we start to do that with AI, we can continue uh, with AGI. So my proposal was to create a uh, fluid wall system uh, that is characterized by agility, adaptability, and uh, responsiveness. And uh, the system uh, of uh, judges is very conservative, so they were very opposing that. But uh, this is the only way to be super reactive to these new phenomena that are coming um, uh, every day. And um, when we are talking uh, now about AGI, of course, we should consider uh, all the scenarios of its origin. It is described in our first part of the project in our report. So we should uh, uh, we should uh, develop uh, and conduct any kind of scenarios describing uh, what uh, might be its origin, whether uh, it will be like an, up an upgrade of the this large language or generative models, whether uh, this will be a new hardware architecture uh, or uh, another development of the so-called evolutionary algorithms, or it will be a result of the emerging property. Um, so uh, we, we need to develop that kind of scenarios. And of course, the second very significant and important topic is 
as I mentioned already, is the value alignment. Um, and um, we should start to try to uh, codify minimal value base in AI. So eventually it can reproduce uh, that in the AGI, but it's not, it's not sure, but at least we could try. Um, and for governance, uh, I assume that uh, uh, what you suggest is the best approach until now, uh, but we need global governance. Otherwise, if we create different approaches and different jurisdictions, we will face only chaos and um, not possibility to, to control uh, it at all. And regarding uh, one of the proposals that is described in uh, our document to control the, the chips, I just found that um, there are a lot of uh, people, a lot of software developers who are trying to um, to train AI models without access to GPUs and CPUs. And they found several ways to do that, uh, like decentralizing computing network, peer-to-peer -peer data sharing, parallel processing, uh, distributed training algorithms. So my point is that there is always been open sources. And I assume that there will be open sources uh, approaches to AGI too. And maybe to a certain point, the control would be uh, impossible or uh, very uh, limited. So this is just uh, um, some examples like tooth of foot of thoughts uh, to take into consideration. And I assume my time just finished. And Mariana forgot to mention that she was uh, the, well, she was Bulgarian Academy of Science, also the chair of the Millennium Project in Bulgaria. And she is also, uh, I think, the UNESCO. You were the representative of Bulgaria to UNESCO yes. on the AI work. Uh, and, and I forgot to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Robin Hood. I, I steal <laughs> from the knowledgeable and I give to the ignorant. And uh, <laughs> so my cover is Jerry Glenn, the CEO of the Millennium Project. <laughs> so now, Richard, introduce yourself, too. We forgot to do that. Uh, hello. Um, I've got a quick uh, deck that I'll share. And let's see if I can get that going. So just real quickly, I'm Richard Plotka. I'm a professor of practice at RPI, uh, director and also the director of information technology and web science. Uh, we are a multidisciplinary program uh, in, in applied computing. We started 25 years ago. I come from initially industry, primarily consulting, uh, CIO, CTO, C-suite uh, things. I started a couple of companies and sold them. And so serial entrepreneur, failed retiree. And... <laughs> Started teaching about 14 years ago uh, and just fell in love with it. And working with the students has been an amazing thing in the new technologies. And so our IT program is an applied computing, as I say. It's designed to take students from other engineering, scientific, and arts, humanities, business disciplines and apply them to the common purpose of life. So we teach them skills to how that how can they make a difference quickly and at the same time, do it in an ethical and responsible way. We're, we're breeding the future leaders of the world. How do we make sure they're doing it in a good way? And that is one of our uh, pillars. And that's one of the things that we've stood on for these 25 years and continue to do so. And our students go on into data science and analytics, uh, product management, security, machine learning, AI, other disciplines at all of the top tier companies. So they are at all of these companies making a difference now. Uh, they're at Microsoft, they're at Google, they're uh, at chat at uh, OpenAI, they're at all these different places. And so, how do we go about dealing with MI, ML and AI or uh, AI? And I agree with Marianne a little bit that it's it's more of an evolutionary thing than something we can separate, right? Because we have to prepare. Now, I'm also coming at it from an educational perspective, right? In this case, so we teach information technology, web science, the computer science disciplines, the business, the electrical systems. All every school does that. We teach the AI fundamentals. And we're making students prepared to work with, develop, enhance, uh, and work with AI and machine learning models throughout all types of different disciplines. But now, how do we differentiate and how do we differentiate the leaders? And I think this fits into some of the strategy for governance is we expose them to uh, a strong core of ethics 
heavy group work starting in their freshman year all the way through, socially focused projects, and real world research and scenarios. So we apply, have them apply their disciplines to real world scenarios now in somewhat controversial areas, perhaps. And so how do we do this to ensure that aid, ultimately AGI will aid society and be a tool for society rather than take over, right? And so ethics alone are not good enough. Regulation alone is not dynamic enough. Uh, corporate governance is too too biased, right? We can't depend on any one company to do it. By definition, they're designed for their own uh, objectives, despite how uh, they may want to work with everyone. It's, it's naive to think that that would be practical to centralize it with the companies that create it. So it requires everyone in the uh, machine learning value chain to participate, the information architects, the data, the data people, the developers, the consumers, everyone, right? And so how do we do that? We educate the future workforce to develop and use AGI, uh, uh, AI and AGI responsibly, uh, protect the human element, keep them aware, and then prepare, prepare the Gen Z and A to lead these initiatives because they're the future. They're the ones that are inheriting all of this, and they're the ones that are going to live with all of it. Quite frankly, it's already past what we can effectively do long term with it. It's the younger folks that have to do it. Some of the projects that we've worked on uh, in the last couple of years, and this is just an example, uh, ethical use of AI in data use at Reddit as compared with their privacy policy. So comparing Reddit's privacy policy with how the actual data that is available through the APIs can be used, and then applying AI to that to see what inferences can be made. Uh, COVID spread based on weather data, uh, flu propagation in areas based on income and demographic data to take a look at how flu and how other illnesses uh, are uh, propagated in different areas based on uh, different demographics. Uh, another one is how a company you've never heard of sends you letters about your medical medical condition. You know, there's a the famous story of of a family learning that their 14 year old daughter was pregnant because they started getting uh, advertisements for pregnancy tests, right? Um, and then more recently, because we've just installed the first quantum computer on a university campus, application of AI and quantum computing in large language models. So now, how will because when we start talking about AGI, quantum very easily could be a big part of that. Certainly, if quantum becomes something more prevalent and becomes more practical, which it, all indications are that it is, uh, we're in for a much faster uh, growth of AGI than even we think at this point in, most, in, in all likelihood. So we've started to look at that as well. And here's a, an example poster, which I won't bore everybody with, but I'll make it available in the slides. And this was um, basically the tool where they took a look at how can we identify bias in uh, the large language models and can we use quantum computing to kind of help uh, assess that. And so they've started doing that and they're actually running on the quantum computer and that's an active project right now. So in summary, who's, uh, who's our strategy is to prepare. Who, sorry? Richard, quick question. Whose quantum computer are you using? It's IBM System 1. IBM, okay. Yep. And uh, so we're preparing future leaders by giving students the tools to excel. Uh, start by creating the best of breed machine learning experts. Preparing, so to prepare, but prepare them to be leaders in the space, not just mechanics. Instill in them a strong ethical awareness. Nurture their social consciousness. Most of those projects I just mentioned were suggested by the students. So we take that social awareness or social consciousness and we allow them to expand upon it and explore it. Exposes them to real world applications where AGI may be used to help as well or it may or could be detrimental. And supporting their natural inclination to make things better using the tools they've developed. RPI's, uh, one of RPI's uh, mission statements, or I guess taglines is why not change the world? And we take it seriously. And that's something that we kind of do. And so we're looking at the future generations uh, to, uh, or the current generations, I should say, that are going through school and what have you to be prepared to lead this. And I think that the hybrid uh, approach that Jerry was talking about, as well as the committee approach um, of oversight that uh, Mariana was talking about, I think those are both very important things. And I think that developing through education, the awareness of what this means is extremely important because one of the problems we have is that no matter what we introduce as um, 
an idea of governance. The lay folks that use this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis just don't care because they want their clicks to be finished. They don't really care how they got it initially unless they're made aware. And I think, and obviously, from my perspective, I'm biased. I think education is the way to do that. And so I don't know if my time is up, but I will stop there and uh, let... Excellent. Richard, let as, the astronaut, as the astronaut has said at the factory that was making the rocket ship, do good work. <laughs> so <laughs> with your students, do good work. <laughs> we are trying. We're okay. trying. Thank you. Andrea, you're next. <laughs> Thank you, Jerome. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, and evening, everyone. I'm very, very happy, honored to speak uh, about the governance of AGI. And I thank again the World Academy of Art and Science for the very, very kind invitation. I'm calling from Milan, Italy. Uh, over the last uh, 20 years ish, I've been developing AI, narrow AI, and coaching data scientists, data leaders around the world on AI. And uh, as a executive consultant, researcher, I spend my days envisioning and developing narrow AI, trying to bring economic value. So today, in my very, very brief uh, contribution, I want to bring the voice of companies that are developing AI, the narrow one, and setting up governance frameworks. Now, I'm conscious I'm talking about narrow AI, not AGI, but I argue, I want to make the point that narrow AI offers already plenty of opportunity to learn and develop governance frameworks that will be then very much applicable to general uh, intelligence and superhuman intelligences as well. So if we take all the successes and the failures, the many failures we are learning from today's companies on setting up sustainable AI governance, we have a good base, a good chance to design and propose AGI governance frameworks. Um, I, I'd like to just a, a bit of myth busting about AGI as well, because AGI is not going to appear overnight. We already said that. It's a progressive evolution. There will not be one day when we can say AGI is here. Somebody would say that, but, you know, we don't trust. Uh, we might not actually even realize. So it's a gradual emergence. And uh, this should reassure us because it gives us the opportunity to learn from the current AI and prepare for the governance of AGI. The second part, AI is developing uh, not in a unidirectional way, but in a very heterogeneous fashion across multiple dimensions, all at once and at different speeds. And if you think about that, this is uh, typical of intelligence in general. So intelligence, human, artificial intelligence evolves irregularly across dimensions. There is not one intelligence, but many types of intelligence. You know, we can clearly see this in the development of narrow AI, which uh, has demonstrated um, superhuman abilities in some areas, like image recognition, language translation, board games. But then the same AI is falling short in areas where maybe toddlers might excel, which require common sense and emotional intelligence. And on this, I encourage everyone to read the... the uh, Stanford AI Index Report 2024, which highlights these advancements and shows very clearly how AI can outperform humans in some tasks and fail uh, miserably in others. So this progression um, underscores the importance of staying very flexible. We need to do something almost nearly impossible to get ready for something that we're not ready uh, to understand and visualize the well. But the good news is that businesses today are, are developing and accumulating experience in navigating this frontier of AI development. So we need to pay attention to what is already happening in companies. As they try, they try, they might not succeed, but they try to govern AI, the narrow one. And in the companies I work with, uh, I need to uh, admit, we don't have AGI, um, however, these challenges we have with AI and the effective governance, uh, since we don't have yet a recipe, they can be uh, applied, uh, similar to what also Mariana uh, mentioned, to the AGI governance tomorrow. So we have many learnings from failures and successes. Let's see what we've learned. I've some, I would summarize them in four points so that they can give a hint for general AI. First, the importance of transparency. 
So transparency is crucial for AI governance, narrow and general, uh, because clear communication about how AI systems work um, allows for human accountability, and we need to uh, keep the human accountability. So transparent practices uh, ensure that stakeholders understand AI capabilities and limitations. This is obvious, but it's worth saying. If we don't see how something is working, how can we govern it properly? We just can't, right? So companies are experimenting. Uh, we just mentioned explanatory and transparent AI. Governments are starting to regulate transparency. We're not getting to that. So AGI would be intrinsically less transparent than AI because more complex, less comprehensible, unless we fix the transparency in the current AI capabilities. That's why we should keep, you know, working hard on, you know, transparency um, and uh, and explanatory, explanatory AI. The second thing is knowledge management. So companies are realizing now that effective knowledge management systems are essential for enabling AI capabilities and controlling their behavior properly, governing their behavior properly. So companies implementing AI um, are trying to make their knowledge assets codified, machine readable, organized. With AGI, this will be even more important because if the intelligence explodes, it amplifies the initial knowledge it has. So if, if, if this knowledge is sort of like uh, blurry, not well governed, that, 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 that would that would be an issue. So companies are realized that, that today they don't need only IT information technology, IT, they, they are forced to enter a new era, KT, knowledge technologies. And this is a good thing because if we have better codified knowledge, humanity can develop more even. And we can control AI even better. Somebody said that uh, the best thing of big data was to make small data relevant again. And I would argue that one of the best things of AI is to make human knowledge more relevant than ever because accessible human knowledge is a key ingredient, uh, a missable ingredient for AI to create value. And AI opened the eyes of men, women to the importance of codifying human knowledge. So let's make the best out of this learning and find sustainable practices for human knowledge management. Third, uh, second last uh, bit, managing bias. Ethical utilization of AI involves addressing and mitigating biases which are embedded really in the technology. And it's important to be very clear on the fact that every piece of bias in AI comes from humans. We should be super aware of that. But it's important to highlight. And I would quote the French philosopher of technology, Gilbert Simondon, who said, what resides in the machines is human reality, human gesture fixed and crystallized into working structure. And this was true for the technology Simon Don saw in the 50s. It's very true today with AI. In AI, we see the crystallized version of human knowledge. So as a consequence, AI reflects the good and the bad traits of humanity. And it's essential to, uh, to govern AI systems so they can promote fairness and equity. Now with AGI, the risk of not managing bias will go to the next level because how can we control biases in outputs that are results of uh, maybe superhuman reasoning procedures. So humans already naturally tend to disguise and try to hide biases. So how powerful could a superhuman AI be at disguise biases and inequality? And the point I want to make here, it's, it's a motive, is that we need to fix biases in AI now, in narrow AI now, to have the chance to govern AGI properly tomorrow. The fourth bit, the last, and I come back to this important point that Richard introduced, is education. We are learning in companies as we develop AI that we cannot govern something people don't understand, or even worse, the people are scared of. So equipping the workforce with the skills to work with AI is just vital. Education and upskilling programs are essential to prepare employees. Now, these programs ensure that the workforce can effectively develop, implement, and govern AI systems. Now, we know education takes time. We need to accelerate now and go beyond university courses. Of course, we need university courses, like the ones that Richard was telling us about. 
But we need to go beyond that because the potential and risk of AI should be taught in schools starting early on. We should avoid classifying AI as a technical notion uh, and, and rethink education, go beyond what uh, Piero Dominici, a fellow of the academy, called the false, the false dichotomies, like scientific field versus the humanities, knowledge versus competency, art skills versus soft skills. We need to go beyond that. Education AI will prepare uh, the society to govern AGI. So education is it needs to start early on, it should be interdisciplinary. AI is not a technical, it's not for technical people. We need leaders, like I'm quoting Richard, not mechanics when it comes to AI. Leaders, not mechanics. Now, let me conclude. I would emphasize again the importance of preparing AGI governance, considering what we have already learned in the current governance setup, especially from failures that we are not able to tackle yet. Um, AI, narrow AI, already showing glimpses of what it's ahead of us with AGI. Let's exploit them. Our companies are the perfect test beds to experiment these new ways of governing technology. So let's leverage them. Let's experiment, codify governance models that enable the fourth thing, transparency, accessible knowledge management, absence of biases, and broad universal education of AI. If we find the recipe that works for narrow AI today, we have our chance to prepare at best for AGI governance. They can be applied more broadly uh, in, in a broader context. So let's think about that. Um, thank, thank you, you Andrea. Very much. Thank you. That that triggered my mind. I should have mentioned something uh, in the beginning. Uh, I'm on the, the working group of IEEE uh, <laughs> putting together the governance for organizations, which includes businesses. And uh, the work is almost all of the work is nitpicking definitions. If you say you're aligning with well-being, what do you mean by well-being? Because the people will use our standards there for auditing. Like, so if an auditor has to say you're okay, what are the rules? Well, that's actually, and, and it, we're way behind schedule. We're supposed to have been done last year. Uh, hopefully it comes out in uh, a couple of uh, mm -hmm. a couple of months, maybe like three or four months, hopefully, and uh, your businesses will be happy to look at them, and hopefully it'll 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 help out the auditing process. Okay, sure. Chris, Chris, yeah, uh, it, 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 we can keep touch afterward. Yeah. Anybody interested? I don't know. They they sell these they sell these standards. I don't know how much I'm allowed to share with colleagues. We'll see. Anyway, uh, Christoph, tell, tie it all together. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, thank you so much, Terry. Uh, thank you for the other speakers. Uh, I'm happy to to uh, have a short contribution. Uh, coming from the ethics side, and uh, as a professional ethicist, of course, I listen uh, carefully. And uh, I must confess, even though I'm uh, publishing on AI and I'm uh, uh, just working now on a book on AI governance ethics, we published data ethics last year with 45 articles, but still I feel like a student uh, discovering the field. Um, why say that? Because it means I uh, can only underline what all of you said. We need education, we need education, we need education. That means uh, um, uh, you are the specialist, so to say, deeply involved in the technology, but the majority uh, do not follow. Uh, but I, let me start with another uh, point. Um, you see in my background screen, the lake of, Gen uh, not of Geneva, but of Neuchâtel, another uh, beautiful lake in Switzerland. And I'm, I'm in fact sitting there, but it's raining now. But I mention it because uh, we are human beings. And uh, while listening to you, there was a moment when I said, oh, it would be nice now to go just to swim in the lake, you know, to empty your brain. And uh, maybe that it's so much complexity in this AI issue that we think, uh, yeah, how can we not to forget to be humans with our uh, human needs to meet others, uh, to meet nature and so on. Now, uh, coming back, uh, just uh, six short points. The first one, what was already mentioned by Jerry, speed is a big challenge. I think the speed of development is an ethical challenge because uh, Value changes, of course, uh, also values change in a high speed, but uh, uh, there is a limit. Value systems are uh, human 
uh, systems which normally need generations to change, or at least years. And that is clashing with the speed of the technological development. I'm coming back to that in the last point. My second point is I'm more and more um, hesitant to uh, to agree with this uh, view that we are now in a total disruption and it's totally new for humanity and the biggest uh, threat we ever had as humanity. Um, I think every generation has a, a challenge and I... Uh, I would say, look at it, we look at, we need some rationality in the debate. There's too much fear. Of course, I also fear. Uh, of course, I also see a lot of problems. But uh, I think every new technology, when we look at the history of technology, has uh, uh, provoked this fear because it's the unknown which makes the fear. So 100 years ago, when the cars uh, started to to run on the road uh, in Switzerland in the Swiss Alps. One full canton uh, said, "No cars in Swiss Alps ever. That's too dangerous, and it's disturbing the nature." Canton Graubünden, Davos. You know, everybody knows where Davos is. Hundred years ago, the canton said, "No cars in Davos, for never." Imagine because it was a new technology and we, uh, the people saw only the dead people and the dangers and, and all that. So I'm a bit more relaxed, not relaxed is the right uh, word, but uh, not to be too alarmist, so to say, on, on that. My third point is the key. Of course, what are then the values? We all say we have to, to, uh, to be value driven in our technologies. And I fully agree with that. But I think we need not to reinvent the values. I just gave a lecture now uh, for on, on the ethics of the UN system and the values in our humanity. We still have to stick to peace, to freedom, to security, to participation, uh, to fairness and justice, because these core values are not just fashion like clothes that we have or we can change. They are over centuries core human values to make us human. Then in that sense, I think it's a verse to say we need to stick to these values with each new technology and challenge and see how can we serve peace and not uh, destruction? How can we uh, serve fairness and not inequality and so on? My fourth point is uh, it's interesting what you said about open access. That technology will uh, allow transparency. So transparency is certainly a very key element. Uh, the second is on the virtue side, the, trans the, the integrity of the researcher and the integrity of the user. And these again are core virtues over centuries, but we have to apply it also to that. Uh, that means uh, not to reinvent the, the basic virtues, but to apply it to these new challenges and opportunities with the new technologies. My fifth point is about the governance. And I'm very happy, Jerome, and I, I hope you can share these slides, these uh, very uh, enlightening steps of what is going on concretely. But I came uh, uh, half an hour ago, I was lecturing 40 Polish uh, entrepreneurs here in Neuchâtel about the uh, ethics of the UN system. And if you look at that, they're so uh, between 30 and 50 years old in the midst of their professional life. The disillusion about UN was the major topic at, uh, during the discussion. Oh, we don't uh, believe anymore in the UN. UN cannot regulate. UN uh, is weak. UN is uh, slow. UN and so on. So we have to sh to motivate people. I still believe the UN system is, or part of it, we have multilateral possibilities for regulations, but uh, it's a hard work to do to show what is the benefit, what is the need, what is the comparative advantage of a multilateral instead of a, a superpower, one superpower or the other, dictating the rest of the world what is right and wrong. So I still believe uh, profoundly that we need, and I th uh, this uh, uh, this uh, multilateral uh, 
governance system in the technology. And I observe that I think technology is the best, maybe has the best chance for multilateral solutions because everybody is aware that we need. Uh, we cannot leave it alone to, to just everybody does what he or she wants, mainly he. Uh, so um, I think it's a chance. We have a, an open door for regulating and governing AI as it's new, as it's not governing on peace and uh, war. It's about governing technology. And that leads me to the uh, last point, education, as everybody here in the, on the panel uh, describes. Uh, I can also make an offer. We in Globe Ethics, we have a, on a, these online modules, we have uh, online courses, we cooperate with 200 universities. So I think we should take the, the chance, you have so much knowledge. Uh, uh, let us talk about the, our online education courses you offer, you develop, and we can help to spread it uh, throughout the continents. But I would like to add one important part. I think many of you have in mind, if I listen carefully to you, uh, that uh, it's about uh, education, about technology, making uh, aware what is uh, AI, what are the risks and the chances. I would say every hour in school, which is about the technology, should be uh, completed by a second hour on the values. I say that because in the Swiss uh, technology, in the Swiss educational system, for example, from primary school to university, what happens is the ethics courses uh, are deleted and replaced by technology courses. That means, yeah, we our uh, kids uh, 10 years old, five years old, they should know how to program. And uh, yeah, maybe on uh, ethics, uh, we, can, we can suspend it. It's not so important. You know, that's the reality in the ministries of education. And we uh, and you as and we all as, uh, as tech guys and uh, girls and, and specialists, we have to challenge this and say to the ministries of government, of course, we need programming skills of young people, but only under the condition that we reintroduce the value-based uh, skills as well. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, one of the things that I would ask our panel and the participants listening to this, as you speak with your parliament or your government or your UN mission representative, uh, as much as possible, keep using the word how. We, we have a plethora of wonderful documents on AI. We've just mentioned a few of them here, but there's a wonder. And after every sentence that I read, I keep wanting to go, okay, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? And we talk about the time problem. You know, there's, we don't know how fast and how complicated. You know, Time is not on our side, as Christopher was saying, right? So the faster we get to how, we got an awful lot of what. I mean, I'm I'm actually quite happy with a lot of the what. Frankly, I'm pleased with that progress, but I am completely unhappy with the how progress. So uh, maybe in the next round on this sort of stuff, we do this. We got to say, how are we doing on the how part? Uh, with that, let's open it up. Any thoughts, questions? Uh, we've got a little bit of time left. Uh, I would. Uh say something um, um ai uh, is mirroring ourselves quite good uh, ai has uh, biases and hallucinations and um, we as a human species uh, we have uh, biases and uh, hallucinations and we are cognizant for that uh in the different uh, because ai is not cognizant it, it doesn't know that it hallucinates and it has biases but still we cannot uh, remove that and actually mirroring our self technology could help us to take another uh, pathway of evolution because we can see um, um, uh, that this is a distortion uh, for our development and when for example when some software engineers are trying to debias the data uh, we can see that the results are distorted. 
uh, we, we can see that the reality is not the same. And also uh, cognitive, all the cognitive sciences are describing that we are hallucinating. So we could not try to remove something that is our own characteristic, but we could try to change ourselves in a better way. Uh, and when we are talking about new education, it should include new digital literacy, but also uh, a kind of anthropological approach, how we should shift uh, facing uh, 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 this mirroring effect. And uh, these are more philosophical reflections, but I think they are important. And another very important thing is that people started to uh, to create um, and to be under the influence of social engineering. For example, a lot of my friends told me, or today AI was angry, chat GPT was angry with me. Uh, and they're, they're describing characteristic and features that, that uh, don't exist so we're trying to do mystif to do domesticate and to rationalize ai uh, like uh, we do with animals but uh, this is uh, our approach so we should consider also how uh, we transform ourselves with the communication of ai uh, and this is uh, another should be uh, also should be a part of the new educational approach because we are evolving or we are changing uh but not that rationally also so um, uh, this is multifaceted approach this is not just technology this is also ourself uh transforming our uh, mindsets and uh, our behaviors others if i may add just to what you yeah. mariana said that's a uh... Uh, a lovely approach, you know. I think uh, the if we can take AI as a mirror or let's say something that leads us back to some fundamental questions: Who are we? What is a human being? What is our comparative advantage? Or what what do we see in the mirror of a technology about ourselves? I think then uh, we see that. Uh, AI sh must not be a danger, it can be, of course, but it is helping or we could reflect it and uh, in schools, in, u in universities, in education, we can help to say, how does it help us to become more human? That's my main message and challenge when we look at AI. Not only how can it help us to be more efficient, of course, I use ChatGPT because it gives me an answer that otherwise I would need two hours to read books and lexica and so on. So that's helpful. But we should not only use it as a tool, um, an, an instrument, but also uh, raise these kind of philosophical questions that you ask. And I would even go deeper and say even spiritual questions. You know, when we, I, I was in a conference in, on technology in India, Indians have the capacity to think of technology in a sharp mathematical way, but at the same time reflect on it in a spiritual way where, where I'm often surprised how they combine the two things. And then it becomes a real human effort and not just a, a technology. Yeah. You know, one of the fir the first thing that hit me when I was doing this IEEE meeting stuff is that here we are pulling together from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UNESCO, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the best values that most people would nod their heads to and saying that's going to be the de decision criteria. Well, that's better than we we as average people. You know, we're smart and dumb and we're moral and we're immoral. We're, we're a mix. So if we have increasing decision-making made with this direction, civilization should become more ethical and moral. Now, yesterday or a couple of days ago, there was a press conference that I missed, that I was supposed to be in, in Australia of a new AI uh, based upon all the spiritual teachings that they could get their hands on. So the model wasn't like all of internet. It's like pull the bag, you know, all this sort of stuff together, make a model, it's called Holly, H-O-L-L-I, Holly. And, um, it's 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 just debuted now, and and I I think it's going to be operational. I'm very operational now, 
but it's a it's a speech where you, you talk to it and this avatar tells you back says you should do x or something i don't know well, yeah i haven't uh but anyway, but anyway uh, just to build on on the the moral stuff i'm relatively pleased uh with the the morality questions and the ethics i think that the people are because when we did the x.25s for the x for internet back in the 1980s and so forth we didn't discuss the morality of at all, at all. there was none of this stuff none mm -hmm. of it and and so humanity may have evolved a little bit because now these conversations are all over the joint and you, this australian group with a morality AI thing. Anyway, you have something else to say, Richard? You've been a little quiet there. Uh, no, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to be able to present this. I love how uh, each of our things all dovetailed so well together. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's clear that we have to celebrate and and embrace what we as humans have evolved to be over time and use and guide AI in that way, in such a way that um, I've had a friend that uh, has puts it in a very interesting way. This is, you know, we're birthing a new being in this AGI, and now we have to raise it. So it is in almost instead of gut governance, it's the nurturing and the raising of a yeah. new child. And I think looking at it in that way is helpful in the sense that it um, gives us a perspective, because that's how we want to raise our children. So how do we raise our new child and it's not a technology issue specifically although technology is what's facilitating it but it is more of an ethical and a uh human humanic hum humanitarian issue it was a lovely um session and uh, some consistency in emphasizing the, the educational part emphasizing the ethical part but also emphasizing the need for governance and the search for what are the real, the the the, the best ways to reach that, uh, especially with this first uh, presentation that we heard. So I think these are three dimensions. Uh, I hope that we in VAS can uh, uh, can continue to explore and. Uh, uh, from my side, I would like to thank also everybody for the very insightful. Uh, contributions, short, precise, uh, challenging. Um, yeah, and uh, it's not the, the last uh, one. I think we have to discuss these things. Uh, it's a process and it's a fast process. And uh, I think we can be in touch uh, to each other and uh, also challenge each other where needed or uh, look for the support from each other. Thank you so much.